Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, I'll switch to English right away, <laughs> since the whole proceedings here will be in English today. My name is Christian Koberl. I'm uh, the head or chair of the Geosciences Committee of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, which is one of the organizations that is responsible for organizing today's uh, lecture. Um, I'm very pleased that we have a long-running collaboration with NASA, so that every year we have one or sometimes even two very interesting public lectures here in Vienna. And today, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Kate Calvin from NASA. She is currently uh, the chief scientist and senior climate advisor to NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. And as a chief scientist, she advises the uh, leadership of the uh, agency, NASA, uh, on various uh, climate-related programs. Uh, Kate has uh, done her undergraduate work at the University of Maryland, and then a master's and a PhD at Stanford University uh, in, 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 in management, uh, science, and engineering. And then uh, she's worked at various places uh, just before coming to NASA at the Joint Global Change Research Institute, uh, which is uh, also in the United States, of course. And uh, I understand there's a little link here to, to Austria as well, and you'll be talking about that. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here taking away from the lecturers. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, everybody here, especially Kevin over there from NASA, who has been our link uh, for many <clears throat> years. And uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, United States Mission to International Organizations in Vienna, uh, which is also supporting uh, these efforts here. And uh, we'll have uh, first some introductory remarks also by Amy Steinman from uh, the US mission here. Uh, and then uh, will be the lecture, of course, and then there is a chance to ask some questions. And with that, I'd also, I'd already like like to finish my few introductory words and ask Amy to give her welcome words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Austrian Academy of Sciences and to Christian Korbel for inviting me to speak with you all today. It's truly an honor to be here to briefly discuss the work of our mission and engage in conversation with you around the topic of climate research and science integration. So on behalf of Ambassador Holgate and the rest of our team, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Kate Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor at NASA. Thank you so much for being here today. We all look forward to learning more about your critical work to support NASA's climate-related science, technology, and infrastructure programs. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the US mission to international organizations, I'd like to take this opportunity to share a bit more about our work before I turn things over to Dr. Calvin for her lecture. My colleagues and I at the US mission seek to advance US national interests and policies through multilateral diplomacy by working with the various international organizations headquartered here in Vienna. These include the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, otherwise known as UNUSA, and its Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS. Our team liaises with UNUSA to support international cooperation on the peaceful exploration and the responsible use of outer space, goals that are supported by the incredible efforts of NASA and its leaders like Dr. Calvin. COPUIS is a forum for science diplomacy, an international exchange on the peaceful uses of outer space. It encourages space research to help inform the work of US agencies like NASA, while also serving as a platform for the development of international space law, regulations, and guidelines 
such as the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines and Guidelines for the Long-Term Sustainability of Outer Space Activities. These voluntary, non-legally binding guidelines represent best practices for the safe and responsible use of space. All nations have a role to play in shaping them and contributing to the discussions which will guide space practices, policies, and protocols in the future. COPUIS facilitates UN-wide collaboration on the utilization of space science and technology for sustainable economic and social development. In partnership with UN member states like the US, UNUSA works to establish legal and regulatory frameworks to govern space activities and strengthen the capacity of developing countries to use space science technology and applications for development, helping to integrate space capabilities into national programs. Through its partnership with UNUSA, the US is strategically positioned to contribute to the UN's Agenda for Sustainable Development, while also advancing some of the Biden administration's key priorities on issues like climate change, global leadership, diversity, equity, and STEM education. As the largest financial contributor to the United Nations, the US is proud to partner with these multilateral agencies to expand international cooperation on mutually beneficial space activities and more equitably extend the many advantages of space exploration to all humankind. But this work wouldn't be possible without research and support from institutions like the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Discussions like the one we're having today play a critical role in fueling scientific discovery and collaboration. So now, to learn more about these efforts, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Calvin up to continue the conversation. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you. I want to thank Christian and the Austrian Academies for the invitation to speak today. I'm really honored to be here. Um, as he mentioned, I do have a connection to Austria. So when I was in grad school, I spent a summer here. Um, I was part of the Young Summer Scientist Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Luxembourg. So I spent that summer, I lived in Mödling, and I biked to Luxembourg every day. And I spent the weekends exploring Vienna. Um, and it's really, really nice to be back um, and to see the city again and what's changed and what stayed the same. It's also nice to see some people, some familiar faces from YASA in the audience today. Um, and that was really, that summer was my real introduction to science diplomacy and international collaboration, something that I now do every day. And so I'm grateful for the time I spent here and I'm happy to be back and talk to you about what we're doing here at NASA. So what I want to do today is give an overview of climate at NASA. And so we have decades long research into climate um, and a lot of different activities going on. And so it will be a quick tour. Um, and so I'll ho have time for questions if people want more information on any part of it. But I want to start with just why climate. Um, so we know from observations made on and above the Earth's surface that the planet is warming. So this is a map of tw um, 2022 temperatures compared with the 1951 to 1980 average. Um, so 2022, according to NASA records, was tied for the fifth warmest on record. Uh, and collectively, the last nine years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. 2022 is about 1.1 degrees Celsius above the late 19th century average, but we're seeing more warming over land than over ocean and more warming over higher latitudes than lower latitudes. And it's not just temperatures that are changing. There are other changes of the Earth's system driven by those um, changes in temperature that are having impacts on people and ecosystems all around the world. So we're seeing declines in Arctic sea ice, loss in the mass of ice sheets, sea levels are rising, and we're seeing changes in the water cycle that lead to more heavy precipitation events and in some regions, more drought. We're also seeing more extreme events like heat waves and wildfires. And we know from science that many of those impacts will intensify as the planet continues to warm. We also know that these changes are driven by increases in greenhouse gases from human activity and how much warmer it gets depends on how much more emissions there are in the future. So what is NASA's role in climate? We are the US space agency that provides end-to-end -end research about our home planet from observations, models, applied sciences, and technology. We have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station, 
um, that observe our Earth, uh, our planet every day. We develop technologies that can help mitigate or adapt to climate change, like sustainable aviation technologies. We provide information that aid in disaster response and inform long-term planning. And we're working to make climate change data more accessible for researchers, planners, and individuals in vulnerable communities. Our facilities are also impacted by climate change. So at the same time we're doing research on climate and developing technologies related to climate, we're also experiencing it and have to incorporate that into our own planning. And so what I'm gonna do today is go through each of these areas a little bit more in depth. So I'm gonna start with our um, Earth Observing Fleet. Um, so this is an animation of the current Earth Observing Fleet. We have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station that are observing things like vegetation, clouds and uh, precipitation, carbon dioxide, changes in the mass of ice sheets, and much more. Uh, each satellite that we launch is designed to measure something different. So we have some satellites that are measuring visible light, so the light that we can see. And from those satellites, we can see things like vegetation, um, so where there are trees and crops, where there are urban areas. We have other satellites that use gravity to understand changes in mass, and we can use those to understand mass of ice sheets. We have satellites that are using lasers to measure distance to the Earth and how long it takes to reflect it, and we can use that to get at height of ice and height of trees. So each of these is designed to measure something different, and collectively they give us a, uh, a picture of the Earth. Since we've been observing the Earth for decades, we can see not just the state today, but also how it's changed over time. So just as an example, for a sea level rise, we have, almost, uh, we have about 30 years of records of using what's called satellite altimetry, which tells you the total height of sea, so we can see total sea level rise. And this is in collaboration with Europe and other agencies within the US. And so we can see both that sea level has risen and also that that um, rise is accelerating from those measurements. For vegetation, so we have, you'll see in this animation, two different satellites labeled Landsat, Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. Uh, this is a satellite that can tell us land use, land cover, and vegetation. So where there are trees, crops, urban areas. We launched the Landsat 9 in 2021, um, and in 2022 we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Landsat. So we have 50 years of observations of land use and land cover, and this is in partnership with another U.S. government agency, the U.S. Geological Survey. And when you look through that information, you can see that our cities are getting bigger. We're having urbanization trends. You can see in some parts of the world we're seeing declines in forest area. You can see changes in the size of lakes in some parts of the world by looking through this 50 50 years of land use and land cover. We continue to innovate and add to our observations. So our scientists and engineers at NASA and around the world are continuing to find new ways to measure things from space, and we continue to launch satellites that help us there. So just this past December, we launched a satellite called SWAT, or the Surface Water and Ocean Topography. Um, and SWAT is in partnership with the French Space Agency with contributions from the UK and Canadian space agencies, but it helps us understand surface waters. So over land, it'll give us the first global survey of water running through rivers and lakes. Over ocean, it's gonna give us a better understanding of ocean circulation. Oceans play a really important role in absorbing heat and carbon dioxide, and the more we understand how they mix, the more we can understand the potential for them to absorb that in the future. Um, so as we're doing um, collecting observations, so I mentioned we have lots of satellites, each designed to measure something different. Well, one of the things we can do is take that information and bring it together to give a more com um, comprehensive picture of changes that there are. And we can also combine this with models and other data sets um, collected by other agencies around the world. And then just one concrete example on land. In land, you know, we have information I mentioned about vegetation and land cover from one satellite called Landsat. We have information about soil moisture. We can measure that from space. We have information about plant water stress, so how uh, vegetation health and how our plants, um, whether they have enough water. We have information on um, precipitation that we can um, learn from space. And we pull that, all that together, we can give information to farmers and agricultural um, and landowners about what's happening on their fields and help them um, think about what they're doing in the future. Um, so in the top 
uh, right of this image is a, a, for, a crop forecast produced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the United States, um, and it's using data from NASA on soil moisture to help improve their prediction of crops um, and crops in the future. And we have other data sets like that. We have a tool called OpenET that can look at how much water um, agriculture and crops are using, and that can help farmers better plan their irrigation and understand how much water they might need in the future. We have a consortium called NASA Harvest that works with universities and um, people around the world to aggregate all of this, um, this data and satellite observations on agriculture so we can help people respond to changes, um, whether they're induced by uh, crop price changes that we're seeing around the world or other changes like extreme events that impact agriculture. The NASA Harvest Consortium works to bring that information publicly available. So that was on um, land, we are also observing the ocean. So one of the nice things about using space to observe the Earth is it covers all of the Earth. So our satellites are continuously orbiting the globe and can measure different things. Um, and so this is sea surface temperatures, and this is an animation that's working its way over time. And from that, we can see you know, that oceans are getting warmer, and so we can see that from the sea surface temperatures. We know from Argo float networks, we can look at temperature changes at depth. So we have some surface and, um, and subsurface observations that can complement our satellites light temperatures. One of the other things you can do when you're looking at this, not just long-term changes, but there are also some um, more shorter-term changes that happen to ocean temperature. If you've ever heard about El Nino or La Nina in the news, um, that is a, a natural cycle that every you know three to five years you could get changes in the temperature in the um, equatorial Pacific, and that actually influences global temperature. So El Nino years tend to be warmer than average. La Nina tend to be cooler than average. Um, and I mentioned earlier that 2020 was tied for the fifth warmest on record, it was a La Nina year. It should, should have been cooler than, than average. And yet, because of climate change, it's much warmer than we would have experienced before. Um, so we're continuing to observe um, land, ocean, we can also do near real time. Um, and so this, because I had to get on a plane, is not near real time. Um, this animation will stop on February 1st, but if you go to our website today, um, they update this regularly and so that you can get up to a few hours um, before current time. But this is just, this is precipitation. Oh, let me go back um, and replay it. Well, it's not going to replay easily. Um, that's just fine. Um, but this will just this gives you precipitation from a, um, from satellites um, information, and you can see where there are heavy precipitation events. You can see where it's frozen, so the blue areas are frozen. And if I I pulled this in February, and so there aren't a lot of tropical cyclone activities. But if you were to pull this in the summer, you'll see you can see tropical cyclones and hurricanes will um, play in this, and it's a continued updated data set. Since the satellites are continually observing Earth, um, we can see this in near real time. Time. And I'm going to talk a little later about how we can help people by showing them what's happening on Earth in near real time. One of the other things we do is we combine our observations with models. And so this is going to be actually a modeled simulation into the future of um, ice thinning. So this is off Greenland. Um, and what we have, um, we have a set of satellites that have measured ice thickness. And this is using lasers. So there was ISAT um, and then ISAT-2. There was actually a gap in observations between the two. And so there we used an airborne campaign to continue to collect information about ice height. Um, so it was called Operation Ice Bridge to, um, to bridge between our two satellite data sets. But the ISAT data sets use lasers to understand ice height and thickness. Um, and so from that, we can, you can take measurements of the past, we can use them to inform models, and then we can take those models and predict into the future. And so this is a prediction or a projection of 2100 ice um, that's you know, using a model that ingested satellite observations, used that for um, understanding processes and informing the model, and then projected that into the future to understand how changes might occur in the future. So we're also looking not just at, um, at uh, land and ocean. Um, I showed you some precipitation. We're also trying to understand the changes in the Earth, the drivers of those changes, and using satellite information to do that. So um, one of the things we can measure from space is um, greenhouse gases. Um, and we have a couple of different um, satellites and instruments doing that. So for carbon dioxide, we have a satellite in orbit called the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, um, and an instrument on the International Space Station called the 
Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3. Um, and these instruments can uh, measure and map total carbon dioxide concentrations around the world. So increases in carbon dioxide concentrations are one of the primary drivers of climate change that we're experiencing now. And when we think about climate change into the future, um, how much total CO carbon dioxide we have in the future is a big determinant of how much warmer it will get. Um, and so these two um, satellites are similar. Um, they are, the, the, the um, Orbital Carbon Observatory 2 maps natural and humid made carbon dioxide on scales of regions to continents. Um, orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 makes these sweeping passes um, every time the International Space Station or, um, orbits above a particular location. And this allows researchers to create these mini maps that are at city scale. So we can see carbon dioxide at a, a smaller scale by doing these continuous annual um, passes every time the space station flies overhead. We can combine these observations of carbon dioxide with models to better understand the changes. So we can understand the sources of that by using other data sets um, someone collected on the surface as well as models. And so then we can attribute how much of the carbon dioxide is human versus natural um, by combining models with observations. Carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. Um, we can also observe methane from space. Um, and this is an interesting example of innovation at NASA. Um, so we have an instrument that was launched to the International Space Station in 2022. It is called the Earth's Surface Mineral Dust Source Investigation. The name of that instrument does not have methane in it at all um, because the primary mission of this instrument was mineral dust. Uh, mineral dust are particles that come off of deserts or off of fields. Um, and depending on the color of the dust will dictate whether it reflects sunlight or absorbs sunlight. Um, and we have measurements around, typically around agricultural fields that are taken here on Earth right now, but we don't have comprehensive measurements at all. And so one of the questions when you're building climate models is, what is the average color of mineral dust around the world? Is On average, is it absorbing heat or reflecting um, sunlight? Um, and that is a question because we only have sparse observations as of right now. Um, the Earth's Surface Mineral Dust Source Investigation, or EMIT, um, when it, uh, its primary goal was to fill in those gaps, is to take more observations of mineral dust so we can understand the color of it, where it's coming from, um, and better characterize the influence it has on global climate. Yeah. Sorry, welcome. One of the things the science team realized, though, that this type of instrument can also measure methane. Um, so since it's been installed on the station, they are now able to observe methane plumes um, when it passes overhead. Um, and so they have, um, what I'm showing here on the bottom right um, is a methane plume in the southwest uh, of the United States, so in New Mexico. Um, and it is something that is observed from um, EMIT um, since it's been on station. And so we're now able to observe methane from space and make that information available publicly. So I've mentioned a little bit about the International Space Station in the last two slides. I talked about the Orbital Carbon Observatory 3, which is an instrument on station, as well as EMIT, which was just put on in 2022. The International Space Station, so we live and work in space. There are seven people that are currently living in space above us right now. Um, about every six months, there's a rotation of uh, crew. Um, some new crew members go up, some um, others come down. Along with crew going up and down, there's also science going up and down. Um, and sometimes those are more Earth observing instruments. So um, EMIT launched in July of 2022. Um, it was taken up to space station on a cargo resupply mission um, and then installed onto the external part of the station by a robotic arm. And then it, um, we turned it on and it started collecting measurements. Um, in addition to EMIT and Orbital Carbon Ob Observatory 3, there are other Earth observing instruments on the International Space Station. Um, the space station, when it orbits, it covers the entire globe and it goes around more than once a day. Uh, it does not do the highest latitudes, but it does get a large portion of the Earth with every um, sweep. And so we can observe what's happening underneath of um, the station at those points in time. Um, so in addition to the two instruments I've just mentioned, I'll mention two more. Um, one, we have an instrument on there called EcoStress. EcoStress is designed to understand plant water stress, um, but what it's actually measuring is temperature. So it measures temperatures at the Earth's surface, and it turns out when plants are water stressed, they get a little hotter, so they have kind of like a fever, um, and we can measure that from space and understand plant water stress. Since it's measuring surface temperature, we can also see other things. So we've been able to see urban heat islands. We've also been able to see the effects of um, activities taken in neighborhoods to cool the neighborhoods. So there is a, a place in California where they painted a street 
white. And what we can see from EcoStress is that street is cooler than the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and so we can see that from an instrument on the International Space Station. We also have another instrument on the space station uh, called JEDI that uses lasers to measure the height of trees and canopy structure. Um, so we have satellites like Landsat that can tell us where there are forests. JEDI can tell us what those forests look like. And so when we're trying to understand how much carbon um, is being stored in land um, and how that changes over time, using things like Landsat and JEDI combined with models and surface observations can give us a better understanding of changes in terrestrial carbon or deforestation. Um, and land stores a lot of the carbon. So when we emit um, carbon dioxide, some of that goes in, um, into the atmosphere, some of it's absorbed by land, and some of it's absorbed by the ocean. And so understanding how much is in land and how that changes over time is really important. Just a, a fun note, we also, astronauts take pictures of Earth from space, and so they have taken pictures of things like volcanoes erupting or night lights over cities. Um, and so we can also use that to get some near real-time images um, uh, but from cameras taken by astronauts um, while they're in space. Along with bringing Earth observing instruments um, and um, using the International Space Station for that, we also do research um, and on space station. So we do a lot of science um, research. We work in the areas of biological and physical sciences. Um, we also do research on human health on the um, International Space Station. Uh, some of that is related to just understanding the effects of space travel on the human body. Um, that's something that you know crew is and crew safety is really important to us. So understanding that is important. But we also do a lot of research that's related to um, climate and has benefits on Earth or related to sustainability. So we grow crops in space. Um, and some of the, and you see an astronaut here growing crops while on the International Space Station. She's taking care of them in this picture. Um, a lot of the research we've done to grow crops on the International Space Station has benefits here on Earth. So we've done a lot of research into LED lighting. Um, so when you're in the International Space Station, you don't have natural sunlight from sunup to sundown. You see a lot of sunrises, um, but you're not getting natural light in the same way. And so trying to think about how do you grow plants inside and what's the right light conditions for that. And so that research is also now used in indoor agriculture facilities around the world. We've also done research into fertilizers. Um, so when you're in space and you don't have gravity, um, thinking about how you get nutrients um, to roots is really important. We also have to bring everything with us to space. And so we like to think about how can we reduce the amount of inputs into the things we're doing. Um, and so in space, uh, we've, we've, we've done research into a fertilizer that directs nutrients to plant roots at the rates they can use it. In space, that means we bring less with us. Um, on Earth, that means less fertilizer going into rivers and lakes. Mm. And we're continuing to work on that. In addition to um, plants um, in some of the research, we also have to support life um, on the International Space Station. So, and some of that involves um, removing carbon dioxide from the air in the International Space Station, as well as reprocessing water. Um, and some of the technologies we've developed to reprocess water on the International Space Station have also been used on Earth in places where people don't have access to clean water. Um, and so a lot of what we do when we think about while we're living away from Earth, is there a benefit to Earth of that technology? One of the things, um, so NASA, the second, the first A in NASA is aeronautics. Um, and we have a very active aviation research team. Um, and so they've been working with the aviation industry for decades. So this is continuing in a theme of how our research and technology can help with climate. Um, some of the things that the aviation, um, the aeronautics team has done is to help reduce emissions and energy use in aircraft. So they've worked with the aviation industry for decades. Um, and when you fly in a plane, some of the elements of that plane come from NASA research. So next time you're on a plane, if you look out at the end of the wings, they curve up at the very end. Um, that reduces drag, which means less energy and less emissions, and that comes from NASA research. Um, and we are continuing to work in this area to help reduce energy use and emissions in aircraft. And we work in a few different areas. Some is aircraft design, so we've just announced a, a, a big, um, a, a a, um, a new project in partnership where we'll be working with Boeing to, um, to, to work on um, how air, the wings are designed to reduce drag even further, and so they're working towards that. We also work in airport operations, so they have, um, they have the ability to simulate how an airport works and think about ways to improve um, how you move planes around on the ground in ways that re 
reduce energy use and emissions, and also reduce the amount of time you spend sitting on a plane. So one of their efforts has been about how much time people sit on the tarmac. Um, so often your plane will start to taxi away from the gate, and then you'll just sit there and wait for a long time. Um, we're working to better communicate between air, um, towers and airlines to reduce the amount of time you spend waiting on the tarmac, and that means less energy used um, and less emissions. We've also been doing work in, in fuels and technology. Some of the work we do on sustainable aviation fuels, um, a lot of that is done by other US government agencies, but one of the things we do is actually measure the effects. So we have the ability to chase a plane that's using sustainable aviation fuels and actually measure what's coming out the tailpipe um, so that we can understand what the effects are. And we've been developing electric and hybrid electric planes. And that's the animation I'm going to show you here. This is an animation. But we are developing an all-electric airplane, the X-57. And it will do its first test flight this summer. Um, and part of what their aviation, um, what NASA is doing is providing all of the things that they learn when they're developing an electric airplane, about batteries, about um, how you fly and how you organize the, the airplane. All of that will be made available to the aviation industry so they can use it in their own planning and development. Um, and that's something that I'll, I'll emphasize a few times in my talk is just NASA's really, you know, big focus on open science, open data, and sharing with the public all around the world. So everything that we learn, people have access to. Um, and so we're doing that there. As part of that sharing, um, our space tech team has a big, uh, we have a big um, tech transfer um, effort, and this is called spin-offs. Um, and so if you look for spin-offs, we release a magazine every year, and it tells you about how NASA technology has been used in the, the real world. We also have some websites that help. So there's a, a website called NASA Home and City, where you can walk through your house or your city and click on things and see how NASA has informed that. I think the, the example you will probably know the best is the, I see one right in front of me, a cell phone. Um, cell phone cameras came in part from NASA research. Uh, we need to miniaturize things when we're thinking about sending them far away, um, and then people can use them um, for other applications like cell phone cameras. Um, and so I'm going to give a few examples of this. Um, the first, um, I'm going to start, though, by revisiting one of the satellites I mentioned before, because it will be part of the first um, example. Um, so we have 50 years of Landsat. Um, and so Landsat was in partnership with the US Geological Survey. First Landsat launched in 1972, celebrated the 50th anniversary in 2022. Um, and it's continuing to operate now, and we're continuing to plan the next one to continue that data record. Um, and so these satellites have been recording the Earth's surface. Um, and this gives us information that can be used by farmers, water managers, uh, food manufacturers, and countless others. It can tell you both what is, um, what is where, as well as vegetation health. Because what it's doing is it's measuring invisible light, but it's a really, really, really highly powerful camera. So it can see not just green, but different shades of green. And you can use that to understand which crop it is or how healthy the plants are. Um, it has also become the basis for many mapping applications um, for la navigation, geolocation, and data visualization. So sometimes when you open your mapping algorithm, it will say something about NASA on there, and it often means it's Landsat data that's in the background. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, but so Landsat has been used, um, and all the data is publicly available. Well, there is a company in Colorado in the United States that learned how to use data from Landsat and other satellites um, to inform, to determine soil carbon levels. Um, so they're trying to, to measure soil carbon from space, and they use Landsat and other sa satellite data. And so now the company helps farmers who want to earn carbon credits for changing their practices, or food companies that want to reduce their carbon footprint. So they're able to tell them how much soil carbon they have now, and how that changes, and they can use that information for their own planning practices um, or other activities. Um, continuing um, on uh, private companies using um, data, so um, we use um, the former NASA scientists had experience using radio occultation to gather information about other planets' atmospheres. So radio occultation is a way of understanding temperature, pressure, and water um, by looking at how radio waves transmit. So something like GPS you can look at. Um, those things all affect um, the rate that um, transmission of radio waves. And so by measuring this, you can understand temperature, pressure, water, uh, water vapor. 
Um, and so this um, NASA scientist learned about how to do th this when looking at other planets' atmospheres, um, and he founded a company also in Colorado that's put the technique to use for um, commercializing atmospheric data for weather forecasting and applications. You can now use that on Earth. Um, and one of the things that we do throughout what we're doing at NASA is try to learn from our other missions about Earth. So I mentioned to you earlier about the Orbital Carboning Observatory, which measures carbon dioxide on Earth. Um, the type of technology in there um, it was informed by technology on the James Webb Space Telescope, which you might have heard of. It is an astrophysics telescope. It's currently uh, about 1.6 million kilometers from Earth, and it's looking back in time, 13.5 um, billion years. So it's about astrophysics, trying to understand how stars and planets are formed. But one of the capabilities on that telescope is it can look at atmospheres of exoplanets, so planets that are orbiting other stars. And it can see carbon dioxide in their atmospheres or water at vapor. And so the team that was working on that, talked to the team that was working on Arbit Carbon Observatory, and they improved the techniques on both by doing that. Um, and so we can use what the technology we develop to explore the universe and apply it to Earth, or vice versa. So just another example of a company that's um, emerged based on NASA expertise. Um, this is called Eden Grow Systems in Texas, um, and they built on published NASA research about growing plants in space um, to create automated energy efficient aeroponic towers for growing crops and seafood. So they can now do vertical farming. So again, we've done a lot of research in how do you grow crops inside, how do you do this with less inputs, because we want to bring less with us as we're out in space, um, and this company has figured out how to do this on Earth. Um, and what this means in terms of sustainability and climate is that you can now grow food indoors even if the, the, uh, the climate outside is not suitable for it. And you can also, when you grow vertically, you can get more in the same um, amount of physical area. Um, so we can increase the, um, the output that we have there. So that's a little bit about technology. A lot of what we are trying to do when we're observing the Earth and, and developing models to help us understand the planet, it's really, you know, benefit to humanity is something really important to NASA. And one of the things that we can do since we're observing Earth in near real time is help inform disasters around the world. Um, so when you look at the news and you see things about wildfires or tornadoes or hurricanes, one of the things we can do when an event like that happens is activate our disaster team. And they work with local responders, governments, um, and communities um, to help before, during, and after a disaster occur. Um, and we have several different areas that we can work in. Some of the things we can do with that satellite that looks at land use, land cover, and vegetation, you can see storm tracks in it. Um, so you can see if a tornado comes through, you'll be able to see the track of that storm. Um, you can see some of the debris. Um, we can look at power outages. Um, so we have satellites that observe um, night lights. Um, and if you look at the night lights before and after an event, you can see where we've lost power. And that's really important to helping planners understand the extent um, of something that's going on. And we can activate that in near real time um, and provide that information. And we often work with other agencies. So within the United States, we can provide that information to our federal emergency management agency. When we're thinking about disasters outside of, of the United States, like some of what we've seen recently, we work with the USAID to provide um, imagery to, and to ensure that you know, anything we have that might be helpful gets to the people that need it so that they can help prepare for that. I'll give a little bit of a more concrete example about fire, because we have a lot of efforts around fire, um, and fire is, is causing a lot of um, challenges um, in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, so some of the things that we can look at with fire is we can see where fires are burning, we can see burn scars and burns perimeter, we can do emissions associated with fire. Um, and so just to show you what you're looking at here, if you look at the right side of this, this is a, a web portal called the Fire Information for Research Management System, or FIRMS. If you Google NASA FIRMS, it'll take you to it, and it will tell you near real time where there are active fires all around the world. And what they're doing behind the scenes is they're taking all the satellites that we, we have access to data from, whether they're NASA, um, and they're bringing that information in and combining it to give you a map of where there are fires right now. Um, and you can look through that and see where they are, um, and when there is, a, we can look at the extent of that. Um, for the other image you're seeing here is emissions from fire that we're seeing from space. So there's um, some fires in, the, in Oregon in particular that you can see, um, and there's smoke coming off of that fire. We can combine that information with some of our modeled tools to look at how that smoke transports around the world and, and how that affects air quality. So we have the capability of looking not just at um, an image 
of smoke from space, but also providing information about the emissions from fire and the air quality concerns. Um, again, we can look at burn scars and burn perimeters, some of the other things we can do is look before a fire and after a fire. So before a fire, we can look at vegetation health, soil moisture, and try to get a sense of where the conditions are, right, are, are, are um, conducive to fire. So where is it that we have dry and hot conditions that might lead to a fire, and we can provide that information from space. Um, after a fire, a, a one of the things that often happens after a fire, if you have a heavy precipitation event after a fire, you can get a landslide or debris flow. And so here we can combine information we have about where fires are, as well as um, precipitation satellite data, and we have a landslide prediction tool that looks at the likelihood of landslides all around the world based on um, the land surface and the atmospheric conditions. Um, and so we work to provide that information in near real time um, when people need it so that we can better understand um, what's happening and help responders in those communities. So we also work uh, um, around the world to help with planning. Um, and here we work a lot with local communities to help them understand how, um, help them face, um, you know, meet the challenges they're facing. Um, and so one of the projects we have is called SERVIR. Um, it is a joint NASA USAID program um, that collaborates with regional technical organizations. So they have hubs all, um, in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America. And there, there is a local organization that we work with, and we work with them to take satellite data and apply it to the challenges in their communities. This example here is from um, East Africa. Um, so farmers in East Africa are also facing, uh, often face droughts um, that impacts um, th their ability to grow crops. Uh, the government of Kenya created a pilot crop insurance program for one county to help the farmers, um, but it was really costly to collect data. So if you're just collecting data on the surface, you, know, you, have, you have to go out and get that information. Um, the, the, through Servere, we were able to build the capacity to get this information more quickly um, and reduce the cost of collecting data by 70%. So the government's been able to now scale up the program from 900 people to over 1.4 million people. Um, in each of these Servere projects, we work with a local organization to understand what is the challenge you're facing? Here are the satellite information products we have, and how can we build a tool to bridge that gap? Um, and so we work there, um, and each of these has a different, um, different mix depending on the challenge in the community. Moving beyond that, we also have a number of public portals where we put satellite information. Um, and we are working to make all of these, um, to improve these and enhance these, but I'm just gonna give um, a few here. So the, the, this one has, this slide has three different examples. The one in the bottom left I've already mentioned briefly. So we're using NASA soil moisture data to help the US Department of Agriculture in their crop forecasting. Um, uh, the second, the one up top is the one I want to talk about next, though. So this is um, the Earth Observing Dashboard, and it is a collaboration um, with NASA, ESA, and JAXA, so the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. And what you, this dashboard does is bring together satellite information from all three agencies to provide information about atmosphere, agriculture, biomass, oceans, cryosphere, um, and more. And so, for example, when you click on these different things, you can get different data sets. And so if you look um, into atmosphere, you can get information about air pollution from ESA's Tripoli um, instrument. If you click on ocean, you can get information about ocean productivity from NASA's MODIS instrument. Um, and there's many more there. You'll also notice there's a tab called COVID-19. One of the things we realized during COVID is with COVID-related lockdowns, we could actually see the effect of those on emissions from space. Um, and so you can actually see from space some of the effects of COVID. Um, and we've been able to observe that um, as well. And so this is a collaboration with your, um, the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. The last example on this is about sea level. And so we have a sea level change team um, that has been developing sea level uh, portals. And there are a couple of different ones on, the, um, the, on that website. So when you go to, to sea level, um, NASA sea level portal, one of the ways that they've been doing is they've been looking at how much sea level has risen in the past. Um, so they've been looking at past changes and they, what they do, have set up is if you click on any coastal city around the world, um, and you can see on this map, this map's about the future, but this, the same 
concept happens to the past. Each of those blue dots are places where we have information. And so for the one that's showing you how much sea level has changed in the past, if you click on a dot, it'll show you both the total sea level in that community, um, total sea level rise in that particular region. It'll also show you the contributions of different factors. So sea levels are rising for a number of different reasons. Um, when you're looking at an individual coastal place, um, some of the drivers, some of that is that there's more water in the ocean. So as ice sheets are melting, we're getting more water in the ocean and that's driving sea level rise. Oceans are also getting warmer, and so as ocean water gets warmer, it expands, and so that's driving sea level. Some of the other factors have to do with land, um, how, the vertical movement of land. And so in some parts of the world, land is sinking. In other parts of the world, land is actually ra um, in, um, raising or rising, um, and that all contributes to local sea level. And so when you look at the tool that does the past, it can tell you both total sea level rise where that in that community, as well as the different contributions. And what you'll see is different regions have different contributions of those factors. Um, and that is done with a combination of satellite observation, um, as well as other observations. So for the thermal expansion, we use the Argo float network. Um, and these are floats that automatically go up and down in the ocean and measure heat all along the vertical profile of the ocean. And so we can take that information. For ice sheet loss and the melting of ice sheets, we can do that from the GRACE satellites and GRACE follow-on satellites. For total sea level rise, we have um, a series of satellites that have done satellite altimetry. And so we can take all of those different components and combine it and give you a, a sense of how much sea level has changed in the past in that community. Well, when you're thinking about long-term planning, it's not just where we are and what's happened, it's also where might we go that's important. Um, and so for the, the sea level team worked with the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and they worked to incorporate some of the projections from their August 2021 report on climate science into NASA's sea level portal. And so now in that particular portal, if you click on the coastal region, you will see projected sea level rise out to 2150 using the different emission scenarios assessed by the IPCC. So it's taking the projections of this international agency that's assessing all of the science about climate change and has incorporated those projections in there. And so you can now see sea level rise in those communities projected into the future. Um, and this is really, um, this kind of information can be used to help coastal communities plan. Moving forward, we have a continued emphasis on um, making data publicly available and helping communities um, to tackle the challenges where they are. And so we are working on the development of an Earth Information Center. This was announced by the NASA Administrator um, in late 2021, and we are working towards um, making this a reality. And the idea here is that we will try to help um, decision makers and, and communities all around the world have access to the information that they need to face the challenges where they are. And so we'll be working with um, other federal partners. Um, we have different areas of focus. One of the big areas that we're working on right now is greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, so we can see that from space and work with other federal agencies within the United States to provide a more complete picture. Um, but we will be working to make this all publicly available. We are planning to launch the Earth Information Center the first phase in 2023. Um, and we're working both on a physical presence, the first location will be in Washington, D.C., um, as well as a virtual presence. And part of the physical presence is to sort of understand what people need and engage with people. But we know not everyone can come to us, so we're also working on a virtual platform where we can get information out to people where they live. Throughout NASA, um, we are focused on open um, source science. So this is broader than just climate and earth science. Um, and in our um, open source science initiative, we're focused on making sure that our, um, all of our science is inclusive, reproducible, and accessible. And some of the ways that we are doing that includes um, the development, you know, making more than just data publicly available, but also all of the tools and resources we use, we're making those publicly available. We're also working to expand participation in science um, and be more inclusive about it. And 2023 is the year of open science. This is now a U.S. government-wide effort um, that NASA is actively participating in. Um, and as part of what NASA will be doing in the year of open science is including trainings on how to, how to make science open and how to share and how to work on accessible information. 
open science is a part of a broader um, di um, diversity, equity, inclusivity, and accessibility, which is an important part at NASA. Inclusion is one of our core values. Um, and we, in 2022, released an equity action plan. And part of that action plan was actually um, had actions around Earth and climate science, um, including moving data to the cloud. So all of our Earth observation data is already publicly available. But a lot of these data sets are really, really large. Um, and we use supercomputers to help analyze them, but not everyone has access to that. And so we've been working to move data into the cloud so more people have access to it, even when they don't have computing. Um, resources. We are also, we provide some training on how to use Earth observation data, and we are working to translate some of those trainings into Spanish um, so that more than just native English speakers can access those trainings and trying to make them have broader, um, broader scope. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now. So that was our research and technology development, um, but we are also impacted by climate change. So several of um, the NASA centers are along and facilities are along coastal regions. So if you've ever watched a launch um, from NASA, it's on, we launch over into the ocean, over the ocean, um, so off the coast of the U.S. into that. But that means our facilities are on the on the sea coasts. Um, and that makes us vulnerable to sea level rise, hurricanes, coastal erosion, and more. Um, so th we also have centers out in California, and they're very they're vulnerable to wildfire and drought. So very different climate conditions out there. This is actually a picture of the um, Kennedy Space Center. You can see a launch pad in the back. Um, but some of the efforts that they're doing at Kennedy Space Center, are, we actually do beach renourishment um, and sand dune restoration at Kennedy Space Center to help adapt to the, the coastal um, challenges that they're facing now. We're also working throughout the agency. We have a, um, a, we released a climate action plan in 2021 that was about our own activities and, um, and our own priorities for addressing climate change where we are. Um, and the first um, three priorities, um, ensuring access to space, integrating climate adaptation into our master plan. So master plan is our process for um, facilities. Um, and integrating climate change into our risk analysis and resilience planning. So we are thinking about how climate is affecting us and trying to take steps to ensure that we can still meet our mission and access space and use space to study the Earth. The fourth priority is um, updating our climate modeling to better understand threats and vulnerabilities. We are a climate research organization in addition to experiencing climate change. And so we actually have a project that brings together our scientists with our facilities team. Um, and they're actually using the climate modeling and, and projections that we've done to help inform the facilities planning there. And so looking at what would this hurricane look like if there were sea level rise as projected under this scenario? And how do we think about planning for that? And so we're bringing together our scientists scientists with our facility managers and thinking about our own efforts. Um, and then the last priority here I've already talked about, about advancing aeronautics to reduce climate, uh, contributions to climate change. And I think I'm getting close to running out of time, so I think I just have two more slides. Um, so the, the last um, slide, and then I'll show you a video of what's coming next. Um, um, so just want to mention some recent and upcoming Earth science launches. So I mentioned EMIT. Um, this is the instrument on the International Space Station um, that is looking at mineral dust and can now see methane. SWAT launched in December, um, and so that is going to look at surface water and ocean topography. So it'll tell us about rivers, lakes, and ocean um, processes. Looking forward into the future, we have a launch planned in um, April called TEMPO, or Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. This is a satellite that will monitor air pollution over North America. So it is going to be a geostationary, so it will stay over the same point of Earth as it orbits. So it'll just be over North America, but it'll be able to give us hourly measurements of air pollution um, during daytime hours. Um, and in, while it's only over North America, it is part of a constellation. So there is a satellite called GEMS that's currently over Asia, and the European Space Agency is launching a satellite um, soon to look over Europe. Um, so there will be other measurements like this over other parts of the world. We're also um, launching Tropics in May. Tropics is um, designed to help us better understand hurricanes and tropical cyclones, so looking at how they intensify, and so taking some, some fine-scale measurements of, the, um, of those types of storms. So this, oh, this is the constellation. So the gems. That's the European one that will be coming, and then Tempo, will, this will be over North America. 
And looking further into the future, we are developing the next set of Earth's observing satellites called the Earth System Observatory. Um, and these are designed um, to answer some of the most pressing questions about the Earth. And so we were, the National Academies of the United States does this survey every 10 years of what are the questions we have about Earth and how can space help us answer them. Um, and these are some of the things that they identified that we should work to observe. Um, and I won't go through all of these here, I'll just highlight a couple. Um, one on mass change, so this is about you know, mass movement around the Earth, um, the Earth, so like loss of ice sheets or changes in groundwater storage. And, and we have 20 years of these observations now. Mass change is going to continue that legacy. And that's in partnership. That the, the, the satellites that we've done so far have been in partnership with the German Space Agency. Uh, the clouds, convection, precipitation, and aerosols are all designed at, um, at helping us better understand aerosols and clouds, which will help us improve climate prediction in the future. So really understanding how those processes work is really important, and so those missions will be designed around that. Um, the last thing I'll just mention on this, we have a, 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 a satellite related to surface deformation and change that will be launching in 2024. Um, this is called NISAR. It's in partnership with the Indian Space Research Organization. And it's going to measure changes on the Earth's surface of, I'm going to do this in inches and then I will translate, of about a half of an inch or so about a centimeter. Um, and what you can do with that is look at complex processes like earthquakes and landslides um, and understand how the, the Earth's surface shifts. Um, and so that will be related to this um, launching in 2024. And with that, assuming this works, I just have a video for you. We're never going to stop exploring the unknown in air and space. We're not going to stop innovating for the benefit of humanity and inspiring the world through discovery. 22 will go down in the history books as one of the most accomplished years all of NASA's history and missions, the golden age of space exploration. So much to look forward to in 23. Climate missions that will tell us about how our Earth is changing. Game-changing aeronautics developments with the 59 and the X-57 and the selection of the first astronauts to go to the moon in more than 50 years. And there's a lot more coming. was a philosopher, a, a historian, uh, someone who had a great grasp of the future named Carl Sagan, a scientist. And he said, exploration is in our nature. We began as wanderers and we are wanderers still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set sail for the stars. We have set sail for the stars. Now we're going to reach out to the unreachable stars. Thank you all. And while I focus mostly on climate, as you saw in that last video, we have a lot of non-climate missions coming up. And I'm happy to talk about any of those. In my role as chief scientist, I'm very excited about a lot of those as well. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Thanks.